If you find tools you like, that's great, but only try to do one thing at a time. Please don't go back in tomorrow and try to do uh, Thursday, Friday, and do 12 different tools. Because you're not going to be able to discern which ones are working for your kids. <coughs> My other caveat is that EdTech is not about stuff, it's not about apps, it's not about tools. It's about what you do with them. Speaking of tools and apps, I'll go back on that and say, but there are some cool stuff out there. Some of the hardware, I've, and my warning is this, do not buy anything during this part of the presentation. <laughs> you're laughing, you're laughing. I have purchased lots of stuff, being like, yeah, that's awesome, I'm gonna try it out. It hits my like, $100 price point of like, oh yeah, that's worth it. And then I'm like, oh, that's a, that was an expensive session, so lock up your wallets. If you want to realize where you can get some cool stuff, by the way, there's a site called This Is Why I'm Broke. And you can buy some really amazing things, like this giant iPad table, or a standing desk made out of cardboard, which is actually really cool, or unicorn parts, which is, you know, not as useful as you might think. Um, big fan of Legos. Love the idea of kids being, you know, fidget spinners and everything that was all the rage last year. Love the idea of putting these on devices. You can get uh, kids to be able to design their own cases. I'm going to go through a lot of these very quickly. Brick case is something I used for a long time. They, they don't have one for the newer MacBook Pros yet, but it was a fun way to design my own version. If you're looking for a holiday game for your family, and Cards Against Humanity is off the table, depending on your family. Those that laugh are terrible people. Um, I'm just kidding. Game of Thrones is really fun. It is a fun card game that you play with your phone. You pull out a card that says, find the oldest photo of yourself, and you compete against the people you're sitting with to do just that. I always think about this from an education standpoint. You can make this a lesson uh, for your students about digital citizenship. You know, find the most whatever, you know, like you can change the questions and do this in the classroom as well. Um, IPBO, if you're not familiar with IPBO, it's an education hardware company that basically took the idea that they can create low-cost, high-quality um, classroom tools. So they created an interactive whiteboard, and they created an overhead um, projector, an or a uh, overhead, uh, like basically, again, 250 bucks for an overhead camera, as well as a fake smart board. Works with Chromebooks. They have a 4K one that came out wireless. I don't talk about you know companies. I don't get anything from them. I just happen to really like their stuff because when I was in the classroom buying technology for schools, these were thousands of dollars. And their basic idea is like, let's make something that's high quality and low cost. Uh, I have little kids. I worry about what they do on the computer. I worry about what they do on their iPads and their iPod touches and on their other devices. Disney came out with a device that is actually on sale this week. It's called Circle. What it does is it monitors everything that goes on in the home on those devices. It tells you what apps the kids are on, how long, and you can, you can turn off the devices for them. And you can keep them locked into certain things. Um, I also found there's an alternative to this app and this hardware device. It's called Parenting. It's available for free. It's <laughs> big <laughs> handle that required, right? So I talked a lot this morning about Amazon Echo. Uh, I did not mention the fact that the FBI will neither confirm nor deny that they're tapping into everyone's Echo. There's a lot of creepiness going on with that. I showed you my son earlier. This is like a whole ecosystem of devices um, of this group. How many people have uh, an Echo device? Yeah, the new ones look really cool. I actually have the Echo Show, and then this one's the one that's coming out in a few weeks. It's basically like a mini version of the show, so you can do video conferencing. My wife told me, she's like, look, it has a camera on it. I know you want it as a nightstand, but it's creepy to think that I'll be watching us sleep. And I'm like, yeah, but it's a trade-off. Like, it's so cool. She's like, it's not going to be in this room. I'm like, all right. Google Cardboard, again, five years ago, you took something like augmented reality, you took something like virtual reality, and we brought it to the idea that it can be a five-cent piece of cardboard. There's a lot of varieties of cardboard. My favorite is the old Master one. Expeditions, how many people have done expeditions in their classroom? It's pretty cool. It's one of those things where like, it's cool and I'm waiting for what's next. Because the idea is there, the content needs to grow exponentially for it to really be 
a, an everyday event. How many people have tried um, either an Oculus Swift or like a VR gear headset? Really awesome, the VR gear, uh, just don't use these when you're upstairs. I almost fell down my steps, Joe. All the flat stuff, so maybe you don't. If you haven't tried Oculus Swift, it's one of the coolest technologies that I've experienced. I had done it years ago when it was like the development kit, and it was kind of jerky motion and it was kind of weird. But I recently got this one, emphasizing the thing the moron. Um, when you have the ability to touch things in the virtual space with those hands, it's incredible. It really is amazing. Um, they just released a, a lower cost version of it, or just lowered the price rather. So I think it's around 300, 400 bucks. You just happen to need a really fast, awesome computer with it. Um, this is the next version or next iteration of what you're gonna see for virtual reality. This is a, basically it's called the Omni. You stand inside of it and you walk. So it basically, you know, you can explore an environment by truly walking around and making it interactive. Um, you may have seen children using this previously. It's, um, yeah. So this is this is kind of the future of that. We all use cameras every day, right? Whether it's a selfie or a Snapchat or whatever it is that we're taking pictures of. Um, cameras have gotten really cool. One of my favorite cameras in the last five years has been something called the Lytro. Does anyone know about this Lytro camera? So Lytro, it, it was known as like the lipstick camera. And what the, the claim to fame was is that it would take one photo and then afterwards you could adjust the focal points. So this is one that was 400 bucks. It actually started off at 1800 bucks. Then it dropped to 400 and then it dropped even lower than that. But basically this is a camera that can take a picture and focus after the fact. So look at this photo of the Golden State Bridge. And when I click on different parts of the image, it will change the focal point. That's awesome. That's really cool. That's all the camera does. Doesn't do video, doesn't do anything crazy. But I love the idea that you can change the narrative with that type of, of image. Raspberry Pi. So how many people have Raspberry Pi in their classroom? It's awesome. Raspberry Pi, again, 35 bucks last year, two years ago. Then you had to come out with the Pi Zero. Putting those things into something like a Pi Top where kids can build their own laptop is really exciting to me. Um, the Raspberry Pi Zero in, in London, uh, or in England rather, they were giving away on the covers of magazines. Computers, it's crazy. Like that to me is again thinking back to where we started, like we get a full functioning wireless HDMI out computer on the cover of magazines as a throwaway is amazing. There's lots of versions of it. One of my favorite companies is Kano. Uh, not necessarily because it does anything better or different than a Raspberry Pi. It's really more for the instructions. Kano was built with the premise of kids who understand what the technology is and how it works. And I find that we're in such a closed system. Like my kids think about computers. I happen to love Apple products, but you can't open up an Apple product. When I was a kid, it's like you would open it up, you change the motherboard, you get more RAM, you change the video card, you do all sorts of stuff. Now it's like, oh, you buy it, it sits on the desk, and then five years when it's obsolete or whatever, you buy another one. You don't change it, you don't upgrade it, you don't actually have much of a say. This takes you through building a computer on the screen. It comes with a little magnifying glass and it explains what a pixel is. And it tells you, look at a pixel. This is, you know, the piece of light, the little light up, you know, and it, it takes you through all of that stuff. And I love the fact that it, it allowed my own kids to touch the components of a computer in a very basic way, but it explained to them how it all worked. Um, they have one with a touch screen. Their software is unique in the sense that it has the ability to run apps like Minecraft. What you're noticing here is a split screen with Minecraft on top and block-based code on the bottom. And as you drop the blocks on the bottom of the screen, it will interact with the environment the Minecraft on the top of the screen. It actually can go into another split screen and show you the actual JavaScript. So once you learn how to write Java, you can code your own Minecraft experience. And I like this because it's not just limiting you to just brick, uh, drag and drop coding. So again, that's a software piece, but it's, it's from that kingdom. There are toys out there, like Spiro's made some really great toys. If you guys played with like BB-8 or the R2-D2 Spiro toy, 
I love the idea that you can actually take those toys and do interesting things with them in school. Did anyone see um, Spiro actually created a, a lock to be used with Break Out of You, which is really fun. The lock allows you to tilt the Spiro on this piece of paper and lock in coordinates. And then once you put in the correct coordinates, it would actually give you a message. So you could use that as a component of a Break Out of You game. And this is something that they built and released last week. It was really neat. It's in the Spiro app that you could use. My favorite app is something called Tickle. It's free, but it has a freemium component to it. Does anyone know Tickle? You see, like, words are not heads. So I want to demo Tickle real fast. What I love about Tickle is it takes the concepts of coding, this basic idea of block-based drag-and-drop coding principles, and it ties it to the real world into what we consider, in many cases, toys. So it actually can program the real world. One of the things I want to show you is how it can be used to program a drone. Um, so I have an actual drone here. It's a mini drone by Parrot. These are like really cheap now, they're like 30 or 40 bucks. And um, it, it won't hurt you if it comes at you. I promise, kind of. But what I'm going to do is, you know, and, I, and I'll be completely candid. I've done this demo maybe like 15 times. It works probably about 35% of the time, but we'll do it twice, and hopefully one of those times will work. If it works the first time, that'll be amazing. So I'm gonna put the drone right here in front of the projector, and what I'm gonna do, I'll show you what it looks like on the screen. It's this block-based program, and I drag out the tiles, just like I would on Scratch or any of these other tools, and I get to program the, um, I get to program the drone that's sitting there. So. I'm going to go into Tickle. What I'm going to do is ask the drone to go up, go forward for three seconds. I'm going to ask it to flip. I'm going to ask it to turn 180 degrees so it's facing back at me. Fly forward for three seconds again, and then land. So let's see how this goes, OK? So I have programmed it on my iPad here. And I'm going to send that command via Bluetooth to the drone. He's going to take a chair out. Watch out. He's going to scalp you. I told you. I wasn't lying when I told you it could break. Um, I'll try it one more time. Thank you. I once had it fly out of a room altogether. It was amazing. It just kept on going. I was like, okay. So I'm going to adjust the propellers real fast to make sure it's not user error, which it always is. You know, if I if it was I was home, I would just be like, oh, turn it off and then turn it on again. That's how it works. So I'm just making sure that these aren't like completely screwed up. Let's see. All right, let's try this again, okay? Remember, failure, it's not a permanent situation. I said that this morning, let's see if it's true. We're doing better so far. So it's gonna go fly forward. Flip. Rotate. Fly forward. Switch. 
It works with light bex bulbs and the Philips Hue, so you can actually do a whole light show by programming it through the app. Um, and it works with a bunch of other stuff as well. There's uh, the Ollie from Spiro and a bunch of other things as well. I like the drone because I think it's like the most toy-like. And you know, you take something like that that kids think about flying with their controller and then realize like, oh no, I can code it. Yeah. And you know, take, taking this a little bit further, you can program things like snap a picture. There's a terrible camera on the top of that on that drone. It's like a VGA camera, it's terrible. But imagine giving your students a charge to say, look, you have to fly through this obstacle course, put up the filing cabinets or whatever it is in your room put something that they have to take a picture of. So now it's like a game, but at the same point, they have to learn how to, co how to code this challenge. And, uh, you know, kids have done really cool stuff with it. To show you an example, I did this with my guinea pigs res in residence, my children. When my son, this was two years ago, so my nine-year-old was just <coughs> barely seven, we did this in our kitchen. And this is the, uh, journal entry that he wrote in school. And he wrote pretty much verbatim, like, this Sunday I programmed a parent mini drone too with my dad and my brother. My commands looked like this. When I'm starting to take off, I mean, he like wrote down the whole program. Trust me, we did this for maybe 30 minutes. Like, this wasn't like a, a whole weekend. But the kid remembered everything. He even drew a picture of it on our table. Not drawn to scale, but you know, <laughs> pretty good. And his teacher gave him the all-important feedback that teachers do when their students at the age of six draw fly drones in their classroom, in their homes. <laughs> that little check of like, oh yes, you've done something, great. So I just find that fun like, to think of a little kid really realizing that they can kind of do that type of uh, activity. Has anyone seen Circuit Scribes? Circuit Scribes, really, a relatively inexpensive uh, alternative to kind of like little bits. You draw the conductive fluid with a pen. So instead of having wires that attach everything, you literally can draw out this conductive fluid. They have all these little circuits that do different things, uh, motors, lights, sirens, etc. And then you build the, the connection. Relatively inexpensive, a lot of fun. Probably the most um, impressive tool is Hummingbird, which is basically an Arduino board on one side and a Raspberry Pi on the other side. You can build pretty much anything with that. It's a great maker tool. Uh, I happen to really like that one a lot. We had done this project at home. My kids were like, oh, make an R2-D2. We had no idea how to do this. So I went to Michael's, we got some materials. We built R2, and then using this, this program, wrote a very, very simple uh, two-step program. And my son coded it to turn around and swivel its head and make the R2 noise. And it was gonna light up and do the R2 noise. It was really fun. It was really fun. So I mentioned it this morning, but maker spaces don't have to have a lot of fancy stuff. This was felt, some styrofoam, and this relatively inexpensive just board hooked up to an old computer. Um, more about the maker. People play with Osmo. Osmo is one of those ones where I like I got it for my kids and was like, oh, it's interesting. All it is is a camera, a, a, a mirror on top of your iPad. But they've done really interesting things. For example, looking at the coding stuff that they've come out with recently. I like that because, again, it takes the physical elements and it brings it to the digital world of coding. Allowing kids to see a tie between what they command and what is actually shown is important, especially at that younger ages. Because the concepts that we see on the like hour of code, where it's like you code the frozen characters or you code Minecraft guys to walk around a screen, while yes, that is a basic building block, it doesn't cement the concepts of, oh, turn left, turn right, let me learn my left and my right, that type of thing, and then building upon it. So I happen to like that a lot. 3D printers have been all the rage for a long time. How many schools have a 3D printer? Yeah. So I like 3D printers. What I like even more is not letting the kids go to Thingiverse, because in my house, we got a 3D printer because I needed to play with it and I was doing some sessions on it. And I told my kids, I was like, yeah, you know, pick a toy, we'll print it out. And if it came like, oh, print me out a Robo doll or print me out a Transformer or whatever it is. So instead of that, after like the third thing, I was like, look, make something. 
do something new. So personally, I like Morphe. Morphe is a free app for your iPad. It allows you to go in and do CAD design inside the app and then save the files in STL and print it out in whatever 3D printer you have. You can share the design, you can edit the design, you can see it without printing it, which is nice because you can know if it works or not. Um, has anyone used this? Other tools like this? What are you using? Tinkercad. Yeah, Tinkercad's awesome. <coughs> Tinkercad, I think, is like kind of the bigger brother of this. Like, Tinkercad is a much more fully fledged CAD design program. This, I like it because it's much more simple. For my kids, just because of their ages, this is a little bit more appropriate, but Tinkercad I love. And it has, as I said, a much richer feature set as well. T-I-N-K-E-R-C-A-D. T-Y-N-K-E-R. Because all startups by law have to take out vowels and screw up the spellings. <laughs> yeah. Um, you didn't know there was a law? It's a law? You talked to the guy who founded a company called Edutecker and was told that I should have called it Eduteacher. And I was like, no, it's Ed Tech, get it? So, the, uh, this is a side story, but you'll find it funny. Six months after starting this as a little hobby, the person who owned Eduteacher.com came to me and said, hey, I noticed I've been getting a tremendous amount of email and traffic going to my site. I think they're trying to reach your site. Would you like it? You could buy the URL for $50. And I'm like, oh, I'm a teacher. I don't need that, or whatever. Four years later, I bought it for five grand. So, you know, <laughs> spelling matters. Spell things the right way. So this is some of the examples of stuff that they printed out with Morphe, a project that was dealing with building the pyramids. 3D printers, again, it, you know, it, it's, presenter law that you talk about building prosthetics for with 3D printers. Everyone's heard stories about, oh, we do, you know, whether it be uh, the Handathon or Hands Challenge, and we build veterans and students without limbs, we build them 3D, 3D printed hands. I don't want to say that that's not a heartwarming, amazing story, and I think every school should do that. Why not? It's a great story, it's a great experience, it's wonderful. I had the experience of meeting someone who has connections to this young lady who built what's called Project Unicorn. Have you guys heard about this? It was on the news about a year and a half ago. So this young woman, born without an arm, and used a 3D printer to make her own. But here's the cool part. She wanted to make one that was unique. Instead of just being a 3D printed hand, she decided she wanted one where if she pushed a button, glitter would fly out at the end of it. So, that's what Project Unicorn is. I'm not going to show the whole video, but listen to her talk about the design process for making this. These, these are, and we put these so it would, it, it needed to be higher, so when I pull these strings, it pushes down, and the sparkles uh, come out, but first you need to load it with the funnel. You need to put the sparkles in the funnel, and it'll go in. And then I was thinking that it could have, like, unlimited sparkles, so that would be really cool. But the problem with this is that it really just spills out, and it doesn't really just shoot out and explode. It goes through. It's pretty amazing. Technology can do wonderful things. Some technology is stupid. This was something I backed on Kickstarter for 20 bucks. It was a hash key keyboard extension. All it was, you know, when you have to press shift and then a key, <laughs> wouldn't it be better to spend 20 bucks to get that key as its own keyboard? I thought so. Apparently not that many thought so because it never got fully funded, unfortunately. That's all it did. But I talked about assistive technologies this morning. One of my favorite apps, and it's free, and you can all get it, is called Be My Eyes. And it's an app that I read about years ago. It basically is a, a network that connects people like yourself that are sighted with folks that don't have the ability to see. So if I was, was blind and needed help reading something, I could go in through this app and basically just, it puts out like a call to whoever's on. And your phone rings and it says someone's requesting help. Can you help them? <coughs> You say yes, it connects you with this person. And I've had the experience on three occasions. One person was really mean to me. So I always wanted to give that as a caveat. Like this person was like, why can't you help me? I'm like, I don't know what you're showing me. 
But the other people were awesome. One person was installing windows and they could not see the fine print on the screen. So they would actually take their phone and they were holding up to the screen and they were, I was like, can you move it a little over to the right? Oh, what, where am I installing this? Like, where is the, where's the directory? So I would tell them on the, you know, through my phone, watching their video cast, very, very cool stuff. One person was uh, milk. Is my milk expired? And it was showing me, and I was like, in my head, I'm like, spell it? Like, you know, but, it, you know, and the other, like, it's like, check the date on the carton. Here, I'm holding it up. Is this the top of the carton or the bottom? You know, like, is this the right, am I in the right spot? Can you see it? It's pretty amazing stuff. We've come a long way. Yep. So we've come a long way with our technology. I talked about Twitter very, very briefly this morning. How many people have done Twitter chats? Okay. How many people have not done Twitter chats because they're too difficult to follow? Only one or two of you. Here's my deal. I'm on Twitter a long time, like almost a decade. I love Twitter. But when I first started doing end chat conversations and asked to like moderate chats, it felt very daunting. I was like, wait, it's flying by at 400 miles an hour. And I had all the right tools. I was using TweetDeck and I was using you know the right, the right software. My head couldn't take that flow. About three years ago, a company named Participate. Do you guys know Participate? So you probably will. They're, they're doing a lot of really, really cool stuff. They have a platform called Participate Chats. It's a free tool. It shows you a calendar of all of the Twitter chats. If you um, are interested in having a one-hour virtual conference on anything, there's a chat for it, for sure. When you log into a chat, so this was a, another conference I'd gone to. When you log into a chat, it actually pulls up everything from that hashtag. It allows you to write a message automatically tagging it with that chat it, uh, uh, hashtag. And on the left hand side, you can see who the moderators in the chat are, who the other people in the chat con uh, contributing content are, so I can follow them on Twitter or not. And then the lazy man's blessing is that anything with a URL or a file gets pulled out onto another rail on the left as resources. So, as you know, you don't have to follow everything that's happening at the same time. You can choose to contribute, but you could also choose to kind of lurk and learn with those resources that are being shared. So I would give it a try. For those of you who haven't done it, I really believe that this is one of the best tools for getting involved in that the Twitter chat conversation piece. And the resources are timely, and they can be also, again, very pointed to your, um, to your content areas and to what you're interested in. Book track classroom. Have you guys seen book track classroom? One person's not in their head. Anyone else? No? Okay. So book track classroom. I'm going to try to do a couple of live demos. This is, um, this is a really cool tool. Live demos are always fun. I'm going to go to book track classroom. It has logins with Google, Facebook, whatever. I'm going to log in. Bless you. So what this allows you to do is to, there's a couple of things. One is there's a library of freely available books that are, have a soundtrack behind them to augment the experience of reading. You can change the words per minute for your reluctant readers or for your readers that struggle to read faster or slower. You can change the font size. You can make this a very, very palatable experience for reading. You also can create your own book tracks. So what I'm going to do is go into my bookshelf. I'm going to see if I can find my, uh, hold on one second. My screen resolution is a little small. There you go. All right, so I've been working on this story called Adam's Amazing Adventure. It's not really so amazing. But I'm going to show you how this works. I go into edit. It pulls up this text editor. So if I wanted to add sound, I go over to my text, and I have everyone cheered. Basically, it's a dark and stormy night many years ago. I'm sitting and I'm typing. I hear thunder and lightning, people cheering. 
So let's come up with something else that makes noise. Um, well, it's not Halloween anymore, but let's make it scary. Just then, he heard the chainsaw <laughs> purring in the background. He screamed. All right. Now I added this, this wonderful, very uh, exciting component to the story over here. I'm going to go back to sound. All I need to do is highlight the sound. And I'm going to go and I get to choose, do I want music, an ambiance, noise, or an effect? And I want an effect. And I'm going to click on that and I'm going to type in chainsaw and search. Oh, of course they have chainsaws. Chainsaws cutting down trees, chainsaws revving, let's see. Yup, that sounds scary. So, and then I go over here and I'm going to highlight he screamed. And I'm going to go, I'm going to go to effect and go to scream. Young girl screams, that works, select. And I'm going to put some music behind the whole thing too. Let me go and highlight this whole last part. And we'll do uh, music and we'll do creepy. Yep, that's good. So now I'm going to change the reading speed, right? We don't read that fast. Let's make it 250 words a minute. And I'm going to go to play this out for you. Bear with the Wi-Fi for, for a second or two. Yep. So it's loading. It's just loading the sounds. Usually it's fine. It was a dark and stormy night many years ago. Oh man, I guess it'll, it's buffering with the with the Wi-Fi, but trust me, super good. Um, it just plays the sounds as you go, and you could obviously change the speed as you're going through things. We're not going to wait for it. We don't have time. What's that? Yep, you can collect them and send them. There is it's premium, so there is a paid one that you can get into, but. I've, so if you're listening here, the tree fell down across the way, blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. I love this tool. I think it's really cool. Again, my lens is as English teacher, so, you know, I think of something like that for my kids that had a hard time reading or didn't like writing, and it, it works on both fronts. I'm also a big fan of being nerdy with a computer. Um, many people know if this, then that, correct? People use it. So if this, then that is basically a very, very simple tool that allows you to create an if-then statement for technology. So for example, my wife, who is very, very thin, likes to keep the house very warm. I, who am not so thin, like to keep the house much colder. Instead of fighting over the thermostat, I have programmed a command that my GPS in my car tells if this, then that when I'm getting close, and it turns the thermostat down. And that's just what happens. She's wondering why it gets colder when I come home. I don't know. It's weird. It also, but it has practical purposes. So for example, they have things for educators. Example, see your Gmail attachments to Dropbox. If you have your Gmail account or your school email account, you can automatically pull out any resources, automatically put it into Drive or to Dropbox or another place. Um, I happen to like those. I don't think those are the best ones for education. One of my favorite uses is that I like using Instagram in the classroom. I know you can use things like Dojo and Remind and all these other tools that do that, but for me, I was very simple with the idea that like, oh, if I come up with a hashtag for the classroom, I could share everything out. I personally think that's fun. Here's where it gets really cool. Use if this, then that, connect it to Instagram, and you can create a recipe where it goes to Instagram pulls everything that you have posted with a particular hashtag and then sends you an email digest of it on Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. And before you leave, you forward that to the list of parents in your class. And they see all the pictures you took that week or all the tweets or all the whatever it is that you wanted to share with everyone. And you look like the best teacher ever. But in reality, it was like a couple of tweets, a couple of things you did that you're gonna do anyway. And it just all pulls it together for you. Anyone using anything like that? 
You do something like that? A little bit, yeah. What, would you use that? Or I, do, use I use that, yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. You're actually the first person that said they use it. Like, I tell that to people, and they're like, okay, that's awesome. Um, you could also do really other, other cool stuff with it. It's a great tool, and if you haven't used it, it sounds daunting in some ways because it, it can connect to everything, but I personally like it a lot. Um, quick aside, when it first came out in private alpha, I got an invitation about five years ago, and I didn't want to miss a thing on Twitter. So I set up a recipe that said if anyone tweeted anything with the hashtag EdTech or EdChat, send me an email. <laughs> I was smart, I put it into an email folder called EdTech Tweets. I got an email from Gmail about four weeks later saying that I had run out of space in Gmail. It was about 15,000 emails that were being sent with resources. So don't do that, just word to the wise on that one. All right, quiet tube. YouTube is the best learning tool that is freely available as a searchable resource. However, YouTube is a horrible place where trolls live and breathe. Um, QuietTube is what I like to recommend for people. It allows you to take a YouTube video, strip away all the comments, and strip away the what's next videos. I don't know how it is that my kids are watching videos about Christmas presents or whatever, and then up next, bikini girls dancing on the top of a roof, and I'm like, how is that related? I mean, maybe someone wants that for Christmas, but not my kids, like, that's crazy. This takes it all away for you. And you literally get a URL that you can share to a particular video without that stuff. While we're on YouTube, another one that I love is called Tube Chop. Tube Chop allows you to edit a YouTube video. You can take off the top of it or take off the bottom, meaning the, the front or the back. Save it as a unique URL and then share that link. So if there's objectionable content or sometimes videos are boring and you want to like clip it at a certain point, you can easily edit it in YouTube in this, this website called Tube Chop. Questions on anything so far? Okay. Um, this one I really like, it's called a web whiteboard app. Basically, think about a very basic version of a smart notebook. Very, very basic whiteboard app. You give everyone a URL, they can all log on and draw together. So you can have people working to design uh, pictures together, working through math problems together. There's some similar concepts like this in Pear Deck as well. So if you're using Pear Deck, there's some of the questions-based ones that are good. I happen to like this tool, it's very simple to use. And the nice thing about it is it works on every device. It's HTML5, so basically it's a device agnostic tool. It could be working on your phone or a Chromebook or whatever else. Noun Project, I made reference to the Noun Project this morning. The Noun Project is literally a very simple website that explains where you can get clip art images for everything, every noun. That's their job, or that's their, their motto there, their mission, is that every noun on Earth will get its own image. The reason I show you this is not because I think it's really cool, it's because our kids steal images all the time, and they have no concept of either A, copyright, but then I've seen kids that, I mean, the, the worst offenders are like kids that go to Shutterstock, they, they search photos, and they'll hand it in with like big X's through it, and the copyright warnings on it, like that's crazy. And I know there's a lot of teaching that we can do involved there, but there's a lot of kids that should be told that they can create and make awesome stuff. If you're not going to make your own graphics, which I think you certainly can tell kids to do that, and I'll show you a couple tools that let you do it. Now Project allows you to use these images for free, as long as you cite them. And if you want to buy it, they're like a dollar, two dollars. So these images are very inexpensive, and kids can use them to print up. A lot of the times I've seen kids print shirts for like fundraisers in the school or their feet for like the deck of cologne or whatever it is, and they're stealing images from other places. Now, are the police going to come after them? Probably not. But why not teach them that they can design with these images that are freely available to them if they give a citation or they can pay for them for like a dollar. Um, font is one of my biggest pet peeves. I like to design stuff a lot. And I like the idea that fonts can be unique. My son, uh, in addition, I talked about this morning, I talked about apraxia. He also has um, just low muscle tone, muscle fatigue. So writing for him is very hard for any length of period of time. And, um, you know, when he was able to start using technology in the classroom, his stuff looks different than everyone else's because he's printing it out and he's handing it in and the other kids have their, you know, their written stuff. 
So what we did is we used this tool called Paint Font. You go and you download a sheet of paper that looks like this. You fill it out with your alphabet in your handwriting, and then it will convert it into a font you can use on any computer. So that's my handwriting as a font. He has his own handwriting as a font, and it gives it more personality that it feels like it's actually your work. They love when he was doing foundation sentences, and you had to write the same word 50 times. I also thought him how to copy and paste, it was really helpful. <laughs> So, I talked about this tool before, but just want to mention it again, futureme.org. Simple website, you can send reflections to yourself, but it's great for kids. I think it's also good for us, too. And I'll, I'll leave with this one, which is called UJAM, and then happy to have you guys come up and share things, or keep going. So, UJAM, one of my favorite tools, been around a while, but it allows you to do, again, speaking about copyright, I used to get projects for kids and how to use music from, um, what's that? Oh, hi, right now. Okay, sorry. So, UGM hopefully is loading over here. Yep, there we go. It's using cookies, that's great, sounds delicious. All right, so, UGM, let me get in. Nope, that's not my thing, hold on. It allows you to create music really easily. Let me, oh, of course, I'm like, oh. All right. This is why we do it this way. The, the name is right. What I'm gonna do is just show you this instead. So, you don't need, you wanna hear me sing today anyway, trust me. What this allows you to do is record any sort of sound and then play with it. I used to give kids projects that dealt with sound quite a bit. Make a new song for the end of Romeo and Juliet. You know, make a, do, you know, if you're doing some sort of multimedia project, write a song or a song or something. A lot of times they come in and they would steal whatever the latest song on the radio was and, um, you know, rip an iTunes track or whatever and hand that in. So, this tool, what I love about it, you're seeing over here, someone literally just talked words into their microphone on the computer, and you can go in and change any of the tracks. With one click of a button, it'll turn your humming, you know, I can go here and like, bum, 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 and turn that into the guitars in one click. I can create multiple tracks, I can share this. It also tells you over here, if you sing terribly, you can drag the notes to where they sound better. It'll tell you where the notes sound good and where they don't. I show this to you not because I was a music teacher, not because I think you're going to use this all the time, but it takes almost no time to create something really cool. You, of course, can download it as an MP3. You can share it with other people and have them add tracks to it so your entire class can create a quote unquote song or whatever it is together. And again, it's a free tool. It's a free to use in your project idea, and uh, it happens to be a lot of fun. So that that is U Jam in a nutshell. Any questions on anything so far? No. So we have about ten minutes left. Um, I'm happy to go and, and keep showing a couple more things, but I also think that you guys have things that you probably either learned this week or just have been using in the last year or so that you wanted to share. Um, does anyone want to take the mic for a moment and come up and share something? An app, a tool, something you do with your class with any of these tools? First. Yeah, sure. I don't know if I need the microphone. It is super lame compared to everything you just no, showed you. But with the YouTube videos, Google Slides now, if you put a Google Slides a YouTube video in a Google Slide deck, you can start and stop it at whatever time you want. So you can get rid of the beginning and the end without too chalk. You can have like four slides in a row and show like a minute right in the middle of the video, right? So if you put a video into, into a YouTube video into a slide deck, there's a, a start and stop time. You have to click on the video, you get a little video editor, and you can start and stop the video whenever you want without having to cut it off and do all that, get URLs and stuff. That's awesome. That's awesome. Does everyone use Google like apps? Feel like everyone, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's funny. Five years ago, that was definitely not the case. Um, 
even even a couple years ago, I think the classroom was really ushered that in and Chromebooks. So you know, it used to be like, oh no, we use Edmodo, we use this, we use that. Is anyone using Microsoft Suite still? Wow! Not a single hand in this room went up. Oh boy. All right. It doesn't matter. I'm an Apple fan, so it's good. Um, anyone else want to share something? It could be an app, a tool, something to do with it. Yeah. Yep. There's also something called PureView, which has the same thing. It takes away all the. Oh, so you do it the what's coming next. And you just load PureView. Cool. And put the URL right in. And just the same thing. Perfect. So that was PureView. So PureView and Y2 basically do the same thing. I find that with the space, is like, you know, the space, I've been in it long enough where I feel like a lot of these tools just wind up piggybacking on each other. Um, Dojo and Remind and some of these other ones, like, just feature swap each other, and it moves us forward a little bit, but I feel like, you know, I'm excited to see what the tools are that's next. That's why I tried to show you some tools that probably you don't see other places, like UJAM is not something that I've seen anybody else really share, and it's a really neat tool. Um, any other tools or extensions, happy to, I'll, you know, I'll give one more ask, and then I'll show you a couple quick things and let you go. Anybody? Nothing burning a hole in your brain? Okay. Yeah. I use Seesaw. Seesaw, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're not allowed to like do Twitter and all that with it in our school, but it's such a it's free yep. app. Um, and parents, like you're saying, parents love it. They feel so connected to the classroom and like. What grade do you teach? I teach second. Second grade, yep, perfect. Perfect. Yeah, Seesaw is great. Uh, Fresh Grade is really interesting as well. Um, Fresh Grade is, I guess, a little bit more fully featured in terms of like uh, an assessment piece, but Seesaw is a great like recording app. And I think Dojo, has anyone used Dojo for that? I believe that they, you know, they've come such a long way, I guess, from their days of just doing behavior management. Um, they do a lot of that journaling as well. Um, how many people use Remind? One person in the back. And you're a student, right? Yeah. Awesome. Do you like it? So, like, for my clubs, like, um, I, like, run one of them. You'll like send out a, a text message to like, and it says go to everyone in the club like remind they're meeting today. And, I love yeah. Ryan. Yeah, we're just really love Ryan. The guy who founded it, Brad, Brad, his brother, founded this uh, website. You guys know what Remind is, yes? A couple of nodding heads. So Remind basically you just you sum it up. It's the ability to text message groups without revealing your phone number. You can set up office hours, you can send out reminders. Like my kids' teachers, like, oh, there's a quiz on whatever, make sure they study these chapters. I find it really helpful. I really, really like the tool. It's a really good interface as well. So that's fine. Let me do one or two quick uh, add-ons here, and then I'll let you run. You can be the first on the lunch line, if you didn't need already. Um, I would imagine most of you probably know Canva. If not, Canva is a really, really easy design tool. It's gorgeous. It allows you to use some really cool design features, very Instagram-esque but to make things for free. They also have good lesson plans written by folks like John Spencer and Steven Anderson about how to use the uh, how to use their tool to do interesting projects for design in your classroom. Um, let's see. I'm not gonna talk about break any of you, but if you want to talk about that, I'm talking tomorrow about it, or I can talk to you anytime. That's what I do, it's my main deal. Um, I'll show you some extensions. One is creepy and awesome called Sidekick. Let's me know when people have opened up my emails. Kind of spy-esque, but I like to know that like, oh, I needed an answer on something. I sent an email, they've looked at it 12 times at these specific dates and times, but no one's gotten back to me. So, they're like, wait, how do you know I just opened that? I, you know, I just sensed it. Um, one tab, one tab is a really cool tool what it does is it allows you to save, how many people have like a million windows open in Chrome? Like I am seriously, like I, I can't declare Chrome bankruptcy, I have like hundreds and hundreds of tabs. What this allows you to do is to take all those tabs that open up at the same time and compress them into one tab, literally. So you click one button and it all pops back up at the same time. The flip side of that is that you take this one called the Great Suspender what this does is that all the apps, when you think about Facebook, you know Facebook, when you, when you load it and it starts playing those videos automatically, isn't that fun and annoying? Well, what the ones that the Great Suspender does is it basically sees that you're not actively on that tab and it pauses it. 
And you're like, all right, why is that important? Well, it saves you a ton of memory, both system memory, and it also saves you battery. Because if you're on Facebook, but you're really not on Facebook, you're on another page, and Facebook has been playing the same stupid uh, ad that's been you know, on for 25 minutes, you're really killing your battery. So the crate suspender literally just puts it down like this, you click on the button one time, it brings the page right back up, you won't lose anything. Uh, this was just showing you some of the memory that you can save on it. It's pretty amazing. You save 20 megabytes in each turn, which is really fun. Um, a general note on these tools, you know, there's there's some ways to avoid pitfalls when you're dealing with the web, web tools. Um, sometimes free tools become paid tools. That's, that's part of this game, right, where people need to sustain and move forward. And I think it's really important to know that, you know, if you love a tool, Try to find a way to support it. I mean, I've said this for a long time, like there are tools I subscribe to because I just believe in what they're doing. And I don't, again, I say this as a former teacher, like when I was in the classroom, I would do that. I mean, $10 a year, but it's something I want to have next year. It's not an unreasonable ask. The other thing is that I think that we have to be really cognizant when we have cloud tools. What I like to say is make sure it can rain, meaning that if you are putting everything into the cloud, allow your kids to pull it back down whether it's their own work, or whether it's a tool that you're trusting to hold their work. I mean, Google Drive, I don't think, is going to go away, right now anyway. But there are a lot of tools that open up and then close, and all your stuff is kind of lost. So make sure your kids can access the work that they're creating and sharing. And the other thing is always have a plan B. We're sitting in a hotel ballroom, and uh, the Wi-Fi not good. It was pretty good, but you know how it is. There's a storm rolling through, or, you know, some, some, some crazy flu thing, and the Wi-Fi stops, or the tools go away. So always have a plan B, and I think that's what teachers do. Um, I really appreciate you guys hanging out with me. Thanks so much for coming. If you have any questions, feel free to ask, and have a good day. Thanks.